To discuss the week in politics, I'm joined by Gideon Rosner from the Institute of Public Affairs and Richie Merzian from the Australia Institute. Now, this week we saw women celebrated, but the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, came under fire for his speech at an International Women's Day event, saying we want to see women rise, we don't want to see women rise only on the basis of others doing worse. Gideon, is he in the wrong or were his words taken out of context? No, look, I think Scott Morrison is reflecting what a lot of, you know, mainstream Australians, frankly, are thinking. Uh, look, I don't think there are very many people in this country at all who don't respect women, who don't honour women, who don't welcome the place of women, whether it be in our workforce or in, in the rest of society, in leadership positions and everything else. I think in 21st century Australia, people have an enlightened attitude towards uh, gender and, and towards the place of both women and men in society. But I think there is concern that sometimes the discourse and the conversation around this battle of the sexes ideas does get a little bit adversarial and it does verge on uh, going from the old first and second wave conceptions of feminism which looked at uh, political and then social equality of women and now is, is sort of um, veering into this very, very hostile, uh, again, adversarial uh, space where we're seeing increasing, uh, you know, man-hating and, and, and discussions like that. So I think Scott Morrison is reading the mood of the nation and, and sort of saying, look, there is a middle path here to, again, respect women, respect women's place in society and as equals and having the same opportunities as men, but that doesn't have to come at the expense of men in society. And I think that's a message that will resonate with a lot of Australians. And Richie, do you think he had the right message, but he maybe just didn't choose his words uh, correctly? Uh, I don't think that's the case, and he's come out to, to defend his message. Look, I, I think there's no surprise why the Liberal Party is struggling to recruit or pre-select or even keep women in their party. And what's worse is their refusal to look at measures to help address this. Because it's not like the Liberal Party has an issue around quotas, for example. It has a quota for the number of nationals that need to be in their cabinet. So it's okay for them to have a quota for nationals, but not for women. I mean, just the Deputy Prime Minister, the leader of the nationals, um, McCormack, uh, you know, is in that position because of a quota. But you don't hear any Liberal complain about how he's taking the place of a more deserved candidate. So th there's just a hypocrisy here. Like, it, it's, if the Liberal Party wanted to address the issue of women in their party or to demonstrate that they were taking the role of women in, in society and, and in, on, the, on, uh, on political representation seriously, then, then they'd find a way to do it. It's just a question of whether they actually want to or not. Richie, you talk about quotas. There are a number of women in the Liberal Party. Uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison's been slammed by independents, Labor and the Greens, saying that he's only got 23% of women in the party. Is, is that enough? Uh, no, it's not. I mean, if, if women represent you know, half the population, uh, there's no reason why that shouldn't be represented in, in, in the House that represents our democracy. I mean, Australia went from being, I think, you know, in, in, in the, the top 20 countries in the world in terms of female representation in Parliament 20 years ago, and now we're, we're 50th. Uh, and, and the only reason that we're, we're in such a woeful position is because we're not putting in, making an effort to address this imbalance. Uh, so it comes down to effort, it comes down to whether you're actually really serious about addressing it. Gideon, do you think there is an imbalance? Do you think we need to have a quota in Parliament? No, we don't. Uh, look, I, I say this as somebody who's been a member of the Liberal Party for 15 years. Uh, you know, the, the, the issue that we have, or the Liberal Party has had historically about women in the party, is that there aren't enough women who have gone for pre-selection. And the reasons for that are complex. Uh, you know, uh, it's partly to do with the amount of time that would need to be spent in Canberra. A lot of women look at that, uh, some men look at that, in fact, and, and say that's not the lifestyle for me. But it, in my experience, it tends to be uh, more women. Uh, but there have been studies that women are being pre-selected to the extent that they are to, in, in, in exact correlation with the rate at which they're contesting pre-selections. Uh, you know, we're about to see the, uh, the results from Curtin, where I believe five women are contesting. I'd be very surprised if one of those women did not win. In the seat of Higgins, there are a number of women contesting and a, a capable woman won in the seat of Higgins as well. So I think we might see the tide changing. But in the absence of women putting up their hand, uh, slotting in any old woman just because she's a woman, frankly, doesn't do uh, anybody any good, not least of all the cause of having good, capable women uh, and men in Parliament. 
Moving on, controversial right-wing British commentator Marlo Yiannopoulos has caused a scene in Parliament this week before even arriving in the country. His May speaking tour was almost cancelled when Department of Home Affairs advised he should be banned. But the Immigration Minister has overridden that. Who's right here, uh, Gideon? Should such an outspoken person be able to voice his opinions around the world? Christy, anybody should be able to voice their opinions in this country so long as they don't incite violence and so long as they don't pose a, a physical threat to anybody else. Uh, this was a bad decision. Uh, the most charitable view you could take on it is that it's another example of department capture or, you know, de departmental people uh, making, unelected departmental officials making decisions that should be left to the minister. I'm glad it's been corrected now, but this should not have been, uh, uh, this should not have gone on for as long as it has. Uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, lots of people have very divided opinions on Milo Yiannopoulos. I personally go up and down on him. But one thing I am very passionate about, again, as a Liberal Party member and as somebody on the right, is freedom of speech. I can't think of a single person who would have voted for the coalition on this issue uh, based on their decision to blackball Milo Yiannopoulos. But, gee, I know a lot of people who would not vote for the coalition based on its failure to defend free speech in this instance. Uh, whatever you think of, of Milo Yiannopoulos and opinions like that, the the best uh, remedy for countering those opinions is to replace them with better, with better opinions and better speech. Uh, this notion of deplatforming, of, of robbing people of forums, of trying to blackball people you disagree with, frankly, is not conducive to our democracy. Uh, and for the Commonwealth of Australia, through the machinery of government, to lend itself to that, I think was, uh, was not a very good move at all. And Richie, who do you think's right here, Home Affairs or the Immigration Minister who has overridden the decision to, or the advice to ban Yiannopoulos? Well, I mean, firstly, the Home Affairs Department, it sounds like they're just doing their job. I don't think the blame needs to be ascribed to the bureaucrats who are basically assessing his character and whether that, uh, that, that fits the standard and, and, and uh, the contours of, of how the visa processing system is supposed to work. But look, I just think that it's, it's quite rich for this to happen this week as well, or, or really this weekend, um, yeah, with, a, with a character who is known basically for comparing feminism to cancer, uh, right when, when the Prime Minister is trying to dig himself out of his, his comments on International Women's Day that have made international press, the same week you have this, this decision, this political decision by the Immigration Minister to overrule the recommendations of his own department, I think just shows the actions of this government, of, of what's important to this government versus what's not. Uh, and apparently this has come from lobbying, from some of the more conservative politicians, as well as some of the groups within the country. Uh, I think one thing to remember as well is around this particular uh, issue around free speech is that speech has consequences. Words have consequences, real consequences that could incite violence, that could hurt people. This is not done simply as, as a principled uh, exercise around whether speech should be free or not but about around whether this would potentially harm Australians if that speech incites violence. And so I think the department was right to make recommendations uh, to assess whether the character sh um, should be assessed, whether the visa conditions uh, should be questioned. Uh, but a political decision was taken, and it's a political decision which doesn't surprise me, frankly, around what this government values. Yiannopoulos, you mentioned uh, violence there. Yiannopoulos owes uh, Victoria Police $50,000 after his last engagement turned violent. Should he have to pay that back before holding another event? Richie? Well, yeah. It, I mean, it, it, if, you owe, if you owe money to the government, uh, then you should ultimately pay that bill. Of, of, of course you should. Uh, you know, it's the same reason um, now that the, the festivals in New South Wales are being requested to pay for police to enforce the regulations that are being put on it from the New South Wales government. Uh, if you owe a debt, then you should pay it. Uh, there's no reason for him not to. And Gideon, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you, do you think there's fears that another, another event is going to turn violent? Well, look, if it does turn violent, it's not, because, it's not going to be because of Yiannopoulos supporters. People who were, go to watch Milo Yiannopoulos uh, generally go to the, the, uh, the, the speaking engagement, watch it and leave. Uh, th this would come from the protesters who go up and protest Yiannopoulos. Now, if the Department of Home Affairs has advised that Yiannopoulos should not be let into the country because a bunch of left-wing protesters will turn up and spark a riot, that sets a terrible precedent because that means that these very same people can effectively 
veto speakers they don't like by threatening to cause a riot. And you might not like Marlon Yiannopoulos, but what, what are you going to say about the next speaker after that, and the next speaker after that, and the next speaker after that, who is effectively blackballed because of what is called the heckler's veto, a, a, a group of extremists um, causing such mayhem and indeed causing $50,000 damage bills to uh, effectively deplatform speakers they don't like. That would be a terrible, terrible blow to freedom of speech. Well, earlier this week, Prime Minister Scott Morrison visited Christmas Island ahead of reopening the detention centre. And locals are furious with the whirlwind media trip. They say tourists will think that's all the island is. Is, is that the message we're giving people, Gideon? No, I don't think so. I think, look, Scott Morrison has been criticised for making a political point by going all the way over there. That it may very well be. And, you know, we, we have to be realistic. We are, you know, two shakes away from an election campaign. But it was a valid political point, And we have to remember why we are here. Um, that, that detention centre would not be being reopened if it wasn't for the uh, decision that Labor and the Greens and others made to support the uh, Medivac bill. Uh, we know that there are reports that the people smugglers are watching this development very very, very closely. And at the very least, we, we should expect that under a, a likely shortened government, um, the people smuggling rings will seek to test the resolve of the Australian government. So, you know, I, I don't love the fact that millions, if not billions of dollars are going to be spent on reopening this detention centre, but I don't blame the government for it. I blame uh, the irresponsible, uh, irresponsibility of the Labor Party and the uh, hodgepodge of, in, uh, of independence on the crossbench. And Richie, do you think that the locals of Christmas Island have a point there? Sure. It, it was like a, a really bad election special of the TV show Getaway. And the Prime Minister's walking around saying, oh, here's the music room, here's the library, here's the uh, outdoor chess set, and you've got ocean views from every corner. I mean, all that was missing was the Prime Minister's infamous catchphrase from when he was in charge of Tourism Australia, where the bloody hell are you? Uh, and th this has been a really expensive gamble for the Prime Minister that is not paying off. And on Gideon's point about why Christmas Island is being open, it doesn't even address the core political purpose for which it's being opened. The Prime Minister has admitted that if there is a serious medical requirement uh, for any asylum seeker that would be medevac from Manus or Nauru, then they, will, then they will have to come to the mainland to get the attention that they deserve, which is not available on Christmas Island. So it can't even achieve its core political aim. It is just a failed PR stunt. Well, the government did spend $60,000 on that half-hour presser. Would that have been better spent on the island itself or asylum seekers, in your opinion, Richie? It could have been better spent on almost anything else apart from this. And I, don't, I, I haven't seen, uh, well, I've hardly seen any reports that, that have uh, looked on, upon this trip favourably as, as either um, serving its political aim or sending a broader international message. Uh, all it's done is demonstrated that the Prime Minister uh, has a very clear view that this is an election that he wants to fight on the grounds of asylum seekers. Uh, he wants to look... Uh, strong on this particular issue. He believed that a press conference at Christmas Island uh, would do that and unfortunately it's just failed. And the West Australian government this week rejected the Environmental Protection Agency's advice that new emissions intensive projects should be carbon neutral. Richie, what does this mean for the gas industry? Look, I mean, this, this is not a surprise, it's not unexpected, uh, and it's pretty straightforward and reasonable. And the only reason the Environmental Protection Agency said it came forward with these guidelines is because of an absence of policy from the federal level. Uh, look, and the reason why this is so important is because you just take one of these gas projects in WA, the Gorgon Project, which is led by Chevron, and the emissions from that project are so large that just uh, in the yearly increase in our annual emissions, almost half of that can be pointed to just from this one Gorgon project. And Chevron promised that they would sequester or bury these emissions uh, when they got the development application for this project. That was three years ago, and not a single ton has been buried through carbon capture and storage. This is the same company, Chevron, that also was uh, prosecuted by the ATO for not paying uh, any tax and, um, and using dodgy means to funnel money out to its headquarters in the U.S. So the, the EPA has every right to come forward with guidelines to fill that gap by the federal government. 
And, and also, last week, uh, Prime Minister Morrison was announcing a number of climate initiatives and justified it by saying these are climate policies that address the issue with cool heads, not just passionate hearts. And yet, as soon as any government agency like the EPA asks for polluters to pay for polluting, then his entire cabinet launched in this fury of passion. Look, I think the EPA has every right to do what it's doing, uh, and, and ultimately the federal government should follow suit. Matthias Cormann labelled the recommendation as crazy. Do you think he's right, Gideon? I think he is right. Look, Matthias Cormann knows what the risk here. The risk is that we create another Adani or another series of Adani. Let's look at what's happening, for example, in Queensland, where uh, the, the uh, Department of the Environment there has done everything that it can to knock out the project and has gone to the lengths of finding some obscure, uh, anti, vehemently anti-coal Melbourne ap academic to write some Mickey Mouse report uh, recommending the rejection of the, the mine. This comes after uh, seven, uh, ten legal... Uh, ten separate legal appeals, it comes after seven years in the approvals process, and it comes after Adani has lodged a 22,000 page environmental impact statement. That's, that's um, about 19 times longer than the novel War and Peace. Uh, we cannot allow for these projects to, to, to continue getting bogged down and scuttled by, again, unelected environmental bureaucrats. Uh, now, if, if the uh, the WA Department of the Environment was allowed to get away with a similar thing than a precedent would be set. And uh, the resources and energy sector upon so many jobs and so much of our economic prosperity relies, not to mention our electricity, would be chased out of the country. That would be fair and equitable for nobody. Richie Merzian from the Australian Institute and Gideon Rosner from the Institute of Public Affairs, thank you so much for joining me for this week's Thanks, political panel. Thanks. Thanks, Chris.